Welcome. This is Michelle Hughes again, and this is Ageless and Timeless. And today I'm having as a guest somebody that has been in my life for about 20 years now, I believe. Is that right, Mark? Yes, and that's proof that you're ageless and timeless. <laughs> if I could keep up with you for 20 years, I think that is absolutely <laughs> well, what, true. Uh, no, I think it's me trying to keep up with you, Michelle. Well, it's true. We have done a few hikes, haven't we, up those yeah. hills of uh, Marin County? Absolutely. Well, just to give you some background uh, and why I invited Mark to come on, uh, as I've told everybody, why is it that I am doing this podcast? Everybody asks me that question, and I always say because I want people to feel that they can be inspired and learn from others and learn to live their bliss, uh, live and be their best version of themselves and follow their heart and follow their dreams. I can't think of anyone in my life that epitomizes follow your dream more than Mark Chasen. And that is why he's here today. And he's going to share with us what his dream is. He's, he's actually just written a book. It's not even out published yet. It's called Living in Awe. As you can see, we're flashing the cover, which is still uh, in the works, but he allowed us to uh, showcase that today. And um, for many, many years, Mark has preached the concept of awe, A-W-E. Mark, why don't you tell us what awe means and why it is so compatible with who you are as a human being? Thank you, Michelle. Um, awe, as a word in and of itself, means an overwhelm of wonder, of respect, of admiration for the miracle of life, the gift that we've all been given uh, to really turn vibrations into an experience of an entire universe. And each one of us has been given that gift. It is also an acronym for abundance, wellness, and empowerment. Uh, I try to essentialize what it is that will actually create personal and global thriving. And it's being in a state of awe and for each of us to have that level of abundance, wellness and empowerment. The, the ability to live a life where it's not greed or overabundance, it's sufficiency. It's a level of comfort, a level of sustainability, um, to be optimally well. And what I mean by that is not the definition of health in our world today of being pain free and disease free, but rather the optimal state of being emotionally, mentally, physically, socially, and fiscally well, and really giving the world and humanity the ability to live in awe. So maybe we should take those three, that acronym, AWE, uh, for AWE, and that the abun abundance, uh, wellness, uh -oh. and empowerment. And let's break that down. So you just touched on abundance, but sort of, but why don't you break it down and let's go through that in the most positive of ways that how we can, as human beings, can achieve abundance, wellness, and em empowerment. Mark, could you give us your feelings about maybe in a couple of sentences on each one, how we as human beings can accomplish what you believe is the dream for humanity. I will try to essentialize what is a 500 page book into a couple of sentences. I know. I, <laughs> I, each. Um, <laughs> but um, often what we've been taught in our world today, uh, our conditioning is that abundance is having lots of money and things and wealth. And it's fascinating to me to go into many developing countries where people literally are living in dirt floor huts and when you, and they offer you to stay with them and they say, all I have is beans and rice, would you like some? And they are happy. They have virtually no material wealth and no money. And yet they're happier than most of the people I've seen in the United States with all of this material wealth. And what it comes down to is a level of connection with each other and the planet and knowing that actually you have family and friends that have your back, that you haven't so lost your connection with the planet that nature scares us 
a lot of times people wouldn't know what to do in nature. They wouldn't know how to grow food or to, you know, uh, raise animals or how to get their water, or how to build a fire. And we become so dependent on a central grid system and money for our very survival. And yet that entire money system is based on debt and scarcity and competition and separation. And so it's hard to have abundance when you're, when you're in fear. Abundance is an expansive state. Mm. Fear is a constrictive state. Love is an expansive state. So the more that we love, the more that we connect, and the more that we know that our needs are always met, mm. the more abundant we are. Mm. And in a more philosophical, spiritual aspect, um, being grateful for your next breath, because quite frankly, without our next breath, we don't have a life mm -hmm. and yet we take those miracles like our next breath or the water or the food that the earth provides us and the regenerative abundance that the earth gives us. And we unfortunately have built economies raping and taking from mother earth and destroying the natural capital or the services and the products and materials that the earth gives us for free. And if somebody is smart enough to, to mine it, own it, build it, extract it, and exploit a whole bunch of other people, then they become wealthy and abundant. Well, unfortunately, uh, that definition of abundance is, is actually leading to a world that is no longer thriving. Uh, three and a half billion people live pretty close to poverty or in poverty. And eight of the wealthiest people control more resources than three and a half billion of the poorest, mm. according to Oxfam. So is it really working? Is this system really creating abundance for the planet and for humankind? No. So abundance is the ability to really connect, regenerate, share, and love. Mm. I think the word that is so key to everything you just said is the word love. And well, two words, love and connection. I, I think they go hand in hand and that we can say to each other that uh, if you feel connected to your loved ones, you have taken the first giant step to feeling the uh, abundance that you're describing. So I, I think that was a very, very uh, important description. So let's take, let's go to wellness now. Okay, I'd just like to uh, address one thing you said, um, connection to your loved ones. And one of the things that I think is causing separation is our relationships around uh, you know, exclusivity, the nuclear family, mm. rather than the connection and love for humanity mm. and finding that unconditional love and understanding that we really are all here on this planet, that we all need clean air and clean water and nutritious food and shelter and connection and intimacy to be truly healthy. Mm. Well, thank you for clarifying that, Mark, because that is so important that we are really uh, one being, you know, and, and we are living in a world that uh, should be, uh, we should be connected to one another, even to people who we do not do not know, but because we believe in the good of the planet, as you say, uh, and the good, the goodness of hum humanity. So if we start with a positive mental attitude, a positive belief system about coexisting in the planet and doing the things that walking our talk to do those things that are important to uh, enriching not only our own personal experience, but that of the, the global village, so to speak. Uh, that seems to me to be what you're saying. It's the first step to abundance. Uh, true, because we derive our abundance from the planet. Mm -hmm. we derive our next breath, our water, our food, our materials, our mm -hmm. shelter from the planet. We derive that deep love and connection and purpose for life from the planet and from each other. Mm -hmm. It is also, uh, nobody is a, is, a no, is, a, is a monad. And that um, each person depends not only on each other, 
for our, our thriving, but also things like the bees and the phytoplankton and all of the microbes. In fact, we're, uh, for every human cell, we're, according to uh, research, 1.3 microbes. So we're actually more bacteria and microbes than we are human. Mm. And that actually segues into the, the, the world of wellness, mm -hmm. that it is our mitochondria, it is our, our gut biome, our bacteria, our nutrition, our exercise, and so many factors that actually influence our thriving. And the concept of ageless and timeless uh, is directly connected to what you just described of wellness, uh, because those are the things that we can basically take charge of. I mean, we, we can control what we put into our bodies and the habits that we form uh, in terms of the choice. Choice really determines who we are as uh, healthy, well, human, healthy human beings. So, so if we break that down a little bit, I know today the big buzzwords are bi microbiome and uh, people didn't even know what that meant until recently and now it's become the big concept for taking care of one's health so can you take a moment I know we're not medical people but I think we both are very conscious people and wanting to keep ourselves uh, healthy and fit so could you just say what a few minutes about what you think wellness really means in terms of the microbiome uh, starting there as that which is really the gut yeah and and so there are um, certain foods that uh, have uh, uh, that that attract the uh, healthy and probiotic, or the, the 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 microbes that actually give us greater health and help mitochondria health, help digestion, mm -hmm. help us to to process and to have energy stores that are easily accessible. Because one of the things around health and energy is the ability to have one energy and to, to be able to access it, much like an ATM. If you don't have any money in your account, but you've got a fast connection, you're not going to get any money out of your account. Mm -hmm. Likewise, you could have millions of dollars in your account, but if you have no connection, you're not going to get any money out of your account. So, so the gut biome and health and wellness and nutrition are key to us having the energy to fulfill our life's purpose. And that is really a big part and definition for me of health. So for example, if you eat lots of starches and lots of sugars and alcohol and, and caffeine and tobacco, it tends to uh, create a imbalance of the healthy microbes as opposed to the unhealthy microbes mm -hmm. and as the unhealthy microbes that tend to uh, cause uh, uh, such things as, as uh, gut syndrome and uh, indigestion and inefficiencies and the more that those microbes actually inhabit the body especially the gut biome the more that we crave sugar, the more we crave starches because that's what they love. And sometimes our eating is actually not even emotional or nutrition based, but it's actually uh, based upon the microbes sending signals that I need more sugar, I need more starch in order to survive. So as we balance the, the gut biome to be more healthy, by eating things that are rather than simple carbs, we tend to eat more of the complex carbs, uh, especially you know low glycemic fruits, uh, vegetables, and if again we're going to eat any form of animal protein, uh, let's make sure that it's it's animal protein that is is really clean, humanely raised. Uh, that it, it is local, that it has a low carbon footprint, that it is in fed uh, a bunch of, of grains with uh, toxic pesticides on it so that uh, it doesn't have hormones and antibiotics in it. So much of the commercial farming that we do is, uh, is laden with antibiotics and pesticides and fungicides and things that are really unhealthy for our internal being. 
and potentially could in fact destroy some of the healthier cells and the healthier uh, microbes that exist to keep us in balance. You know, Mark, so much of what you said, uh, it it's, uh, almost sounds like you could be a medical doctor or at least a uh, nutritionist. No. <laughs> I, know you're, I know you're not. I've just did a little research and experimented on myself. Well, that's it. You've been your own best teacher and, uh, and victim <laughs> by experiencing uh, or experimenting on yourself, as you say. But, um, you know, so much of leaky gut, for example, it comes from a bad diet and people can control exactly the uh, input you know, it's, it's like, it's like w we always say food is your medicine, right? And yeah. But what you put in is what you get back. And if you put in garbage, garbage in, garbage out, as they say in the tech technology world, right? In uh -huh. computers. So um, I did want to ask you, though, before we move on to empowerment on uh, uh, wellness, is uh, what, if you were going to give our viewers uh, just a little, like, daily habits to form and using what you just described about the complex carbs, the vegetables, the, the grass fed protein, uh, or at least clean proteins organically grown. Uh, yeah, I, I haven't really seen much grass fed fish. Yeah, um, not grass fed fish. I'm sorry. <laughs> you know, and but, maybe if you're vegan, we'll just do you know grass fed grass. Right, uh, but, but 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 at least wild. Um, wildly caught rather than farm raised is in the fish category. Yeah, or, or at least if, if they are, you know, open ocean fisheries that practice, uh, you know, really truly healthy, mm -hmm. humane and sustainable mm -hmm. ways of, of raising uh, the fish and then also releasing the fish to actually um, regenerate our, our, you know, the ocean's fisheries, mm -hmm. that actually is a really wonderful practice. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, where I think we have uh, seen some horrible degradation of forests and lands, and we're seeing it in the Amazon right now, and have for many years where the Amazon gets uh, slash burned in order to raise cattle, or how many, how, how much arable land has then been denuded completely and trampled on by cows to raise to raise cattle and then left denuded and degraded um so you know there's a whole economy though around agroforestry and permaculture farming and the integration of those things to actually restore our arable lands um and yet if we're going to eat beef even if it's farm raised i mean even if it's uh, pasture raised and even if it's grass fed um it still takes roughly about 2,000 gallons of water for every pound of beef. And most of the beef also has a massive carbon footprint to it, not to mention, uh, you know, the, the, uh, the burps of the cows that create tons of methane. And so, mm -hmm. so the, we can actually do a lot for the environment and for our own health by I'm not telling anybody to stop eating beef, but to at, at least, cut down the consumption of beef mm -hmm. and use other sources of animal protein if you feel that it's necessary for your health mm -hmm. to to at least do it from conscious sources raised in ways that are humane and good for the animals because i really believe that we take on the energy of our food too mm -hmm. So true. And, you know, what you just described is, is almost, to, li to listeners, is almost daunting how challenging it could be, it can be, if you don't take the, break it down into the simplest habits, the, you know, the shopping organically if you can, uh, eating, as you said, uh, sustainable, uh, grown or farmed fish, or if, if even better, wildly caught fish, uh, those kinds of things take a lot of conscious effort. And t typically, they're even more expensive uh, if you're trying to put a budget together for your food um, uh, consumption. So what I was asking is... If Although, we could... The interesting thing is that a lot of people actually use that argument that I eat fast foods uh, and uh, I don't do organic because I don't have the money. Yeah. And, and it takes too much time or, and this is the interesting thing, the big, I don't have enough time to be healthy excuse. Yeah. And you, you asked a question, which we'll return to based on that, but it's interesting 
that the last time I checked, uh, a Big Mac was somewhere between four to five dollars <laughs> uh, for for a half a pound of, if you can call it food. Yeah. Um, and yet, a salad bar at Whole Foods is four dollars and fifty cents for a half a pound. Mm -hmm. So you know the the it's too expensive argument doesn't fly. And mm -hmm. for those that don't seem to feel they have enough time to be healthy, you know. Do you go and get your oil changed on your car or do you just ignore it and just want to Wait. spend the money for a transmission right. later on? Right. And so, so one of the things that I created was a, a protocol around wellness using the acronym of medicine. And that's what I was about to get to. So I'm so happy you're saying this because I wanted us to go there to that acronym. So let me just, before you get to that, just answer that one question. If, if you were not educated to all of the things that you are describing, but you wanted, you desired to be healthier. And uh -huh. I think that maybe typifies a good segment of our population. You want something, but you're not knowledgeable. You haven't had all the experience that you have. So make it simple, Mark. What can we do? What would be breakfast? What would be lunch? And what would be dinner? Typically, if we were going to journey off into the healthy lifestyle, can you give us a little sampling of what you would do uh, to help a person like that? Sure. First of all, I would start with our intake of air. So one thing that if you don't have a lot of time in your day, mm -hmm. stress is a, is a big cause of, of disease. One of the biggest causes mm -hmm. next to inflammation. And so I'm going to ask you to do something for the audience, Michelle. Mm -hmm. And that is, let's both just take a conscious breath right now. Mm. Oh. Wow, that took a lot of time, didn't it? Right. <laughs> you and, know, and, and it sure and did feel we, good. <laughs> and it feels better. And yeah. if if we just stopped and took even one conscious breath an hour, and if we actually then started during our conversation, now that we have taken that conscious breath, let's continue to do that. Yeah. And our discussion can continue with very little in the way of any breaks as I'm just taking conscious breaths mm -hmm. and having a conversation with you. So mm -hmm. that's one is just train people to really um, just breathe consciously mm -hmm. and to relax into their body and not carry around so much stress. Mm -hmm. uh, psychologists say that we're born with two fears, the fear of loud noises and falling, which we probably learn in, your, in utero. And yet the DSM manual has something like about 150 phobias so we learn to be scared of just about everything, mm -hmm. including the unknown. <laughs> and we don't know anything as humans really on a, on a cosmic scale. And so how do, we, how do we first of all just take time to let the stress and fear go in our lives and to expand rather than compress? How to go into the, the uh, parasympathetic relaxed state of being rather than that fight and flight sympathetic nervous system mode. Mm -hmm. So that's one thing that everybody can do is take a breath. Mm -hmm. And that's where it segues to meditation, which uh, could be another uh, protocol for people who want to take it to another level and, and get into that quiet state more consciously every single day. Right. So, but you asked, you know, what can people do nutritionally? Um, so you said something before that I just really want to clarify. Um, that we have a choice of what we take into our bodies. And often, yes, we have a choice of the food we eat, but many people don't think of the skin as absorbing you know, many of the toxins or our lungs absorbing toxins. And there's lead and mercury and aluminum in our atmosphere. And so it's very important not only to watch what we eat, but to also watch the environment that we're in. And the acronym of medicine, uh, the M stands for mindfulness, meditation, and optimizing states of being. So in fact, we just did that just by taking a conscious breath, mm -hmm. by being aware of something that's autonomic and stopping for just a moment to, to be inward, to be quiet. And from that place, we can really look at and evaluate 
what kind of state of being are we in? Because our quality of life is so impacted by our state of being. So then the next thing is, is a lot of times people sit sedentary all day long. So the E stands for exercise and breath. Mm -hmm. So by our breath is a way of actually eliminating toxins aside from our bowel movements, our urine, our sweat. Um, and so there are several different ways that we eliminate toxins. And by being more conscious of breath and exercising, getting our hearts, our heart rates going, we actually increase the viability and the efficiency of our systems to detox. And we also increase our energy output. We increase potentially, depending on our exercise, our muscle mass, our metabolism. So now the body just naturally goes to its ideal weight. And so those that are fighting, you know, to be overweight, to not exercise is, is something that will contribute to, you know, weight gain. Mm -hmm. So how can you exercise at your desk? How can, for instance, I'm just going to do something here, Michelle, mm -hmm. uh, I'm just going to stand up mm -hmm. and I can still have a conversation with you mm -hmm. while I'm stretching, mm -hmm. while I'm moving. Now, for most people, culturally, this seems a little bizarre <laughs> that, you know, I mean, we can actually stand here and I might just keep the conversation going while I go into downward dog or something. <laughs> but, you know, um, we, we actually can take a walk. With our when we're having a meeting, we can exercise and move while we're having a meeting. Uh, I find that a lot of the work I do is is actually with my computer on the elliptical machine, and so that there's ways to move and exercise even while we're working. Mm -hmm. And then coming to that question about the D in medicine is diet and nutrition. So what are the things that you can do? Uh, to have a healthier diet. And I think we covered some of those things where, uh, you know, uh, anaerobic microbes in and destructive microbes in our gut biome that crave sugar. If we stop feeding them sugar and we stop feeding them starches and simple carbohydrates and we, we eat things, uh, if you really have a sugar craving, uh, potentially eat some low glycemic fruit like berries or apples or, you know, banana is higher glycemic, but it has, it's loaded with lots of wonderful nutrients like potassium. And so um, there's, there's, we can substitute fruit for the candies, or if we look at um, potentially a, a low glycemic fruit or nut bar, as opposed to that chocolate filled with chemicals, um, I, I tend to eat uh, a probiotic coconut yogurt with fruit and a fiber mix in the morning. Mm. Um, for somebody who's used to bacon and eggs, mm. that's going to be a, 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 a pretty rough departure. Mm. Um, so, uh, you know, maybe it's starting with poached eggs and turkey bacon as a transition. Mm. Um, maybe... Uh, you can just eat your bacon and eggs only three days a week and then supplement with uh, some probiotic uh, coconut yogurt and some beautiful fresh organic fruits and a, a fiber mix, which will actually be very filling. But compared to that hot cooked bacon and eggs, it may not be for a while. So I would recommend that people uh, try to find substitutes for, you know, the, the, uh, high saturated fat diets mm. uh, although now you know who knows who's right um you know a lot of people are saying you know go with a keto diet eat lots of fats eat lots of proteins and you don't have to eat that many simple you know, or, or complex carbs and you eliminate all the simple carbs i think the agreement is eliminating simple carbs well this seems to be constantly uh, a fad <clears throat> a fad diet and I hate you, I don't even like to use the word diet I see you have diet and nutrition as part of the acronym but I think you mean diet in the broadest sense of the word not in the abstinence of something uh, or a discipline of one kind or another but more about how you feed you know how you feed yourself and, and what, words, what do you eat 
yeah, what is what your, do, diet, that's not, your diet yeah. or on a diet? Yeah. And I, I really intentionally didn't put in the book a, a silver bullet, one size fits all diet because yeah. as you know, Michelle, that just doesn't, it doesn't work. work. And there's a saying, everything in moderation, including moderation. Right. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> really? And so, you know, every every few years, scientists and doctors come up with, oh, we were wrong about everything we just said for the last 10 years. Now, here's the way to go. Right. And, and my sense is that part of it is just an awareness around what really works for you as a person. There are people... I've actually known a couple of breatharians. So, um, <laughs> you know, if you could live on air, hallelujah. Um, but uh, most people can't, and it's a very rare percentage of the population. Um, on the other hand, there are vegans and vegetarians who have muscle and energy, and they're, they're, it works for them. I've tried it. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I realized that I'm type O blood. Um, that I, uh, for me to be healthy, I do need to have some animal protein in my diet and that I've tried being a vegan for a year. I've tried being a vegetarian for a year. And although I would say primarily most of my diet is actually raw vegan, I do supplement primarily with seafood. So I guess I'm a seagan or a vegetarian. (laughs) And, uh, <laughs> that's a good one vegetarian <laughs> that's a new one we better put that one in your book <laughs> you've coined a new word it might, it might be in there somewhere but really? to your point if to your point michelle um i i would say that if you are healthy and if you have lots of energy and if you are happy and if you are not overweight and if you are not on pharmaceuticals you're probably doing something right uh, if on the other hand, you're overweight, you're tired, uh, you don't have enough energy, you're on pharmaceuticals, um, then a lot of that can be done with diet and exercise mm-hmm. and optimizing your states of being. Mm-hmm. Um, as well, we were talking about um, the, the issue of living in a, an environment that has lots of, lots of toxicity in it, whether it's the off-gassing of fermented woods and, and plastic carpets in our cars and our offices and our homes, uh, or the, the atmosphere, which has tons of, of uh, carbon dioxide and, and fossil fuel particulates and lead and mercury and asphalt and, yeah, I mean, uh, 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 God, asphalt, what was that? And thinking? all the, uh, well, um, it, you know what, it, the... And what about the cell phone towers? I mean, the EFTs. Yeah, well, you know, I mean, we're talking, sure. You know, you do have 5G coming and you do have electromagnetic magnetic frequencies. You also have those coming from the sun. But, you know, we, we do have, uh, I, the word I was looking for was asbestos. Uh, but, oh, you know, asbestos. we have all these, mm-hmm. all these heavy metals that are toxic to us in our atmosphere. So it's also in, important to understand, you know, how to live in a clean environment how to internally detox in order to be healthy too and that's that's the the eye in medicine right the internal clean cleansing so uh, not everybody is going to be in favor of uh, doing a detox in the more uh, extreme sense of that but there are ways to detox through your diet and you have touched on that so without having to go through i i know the one that i i always kind of gag at is when my my nutrition or my preventative medicine doctor says oh have you done a liver detox and I say no because he's talking about taking uh, drinking olive oil with lemon you know the master cleanse thing and you know for me like you said one size does not fit all so I I can't get there and so I have to look at what I put in my body every day more than the extreme of uh, detoxing and fasting. But for some people, that might be the only answer because they have so much toxicity. I don't know. How do you feel about that, Mark? Um, well, I've done a liver detox. I haven't eaten any liver in years. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but, but, but Mark, but, can, can you drink olive oil and, and yeah, lemon it was, juice? It's not that bad. I've, I've done, I, it was started by Hulda Clark. And, yeah, Hulda uh, Clark, it, that's it, right. Yeah. 
and you do, uh, you know, a magnesium grapefruit mix, and then you Ugh. do grapefruit and olive oil, and you know, it just flushes the liver and the gallbladder, and I feel really good afterwards. Uh, I know it's yeah, supposed it's, to be. It's not for the it's not for the faint of heart, right. and uh, it is probably a bit more intense. However, if you want to, there are things like chlorella mm -hmm. and cilantro that help remove heavy metals from from the body. Mm -hmm. uh, there are uh, there there's a volcanic substance called zeolite that can be used to remove heavy metals from the body. So as long as you regularly do some kind of a, a, a you know, a heavy metal detox, and it, also I'm a fan of intermittent fasting. So what yeah. that means is, um, you know, don't eat past a six o'clock in the evening and uh, don't eat until noon. Right. And um, mm. so that you can drink liquids and things like that. And often I'll just drink a, a a detoxing veggie juice and there's mm -hmm. so many fresh veggie juice stands everywhere or you can make your own and so you just have a little veggie juice in the morning uh potentially with either a chlorella or a spirulina or with some cilantro and things that really help move toxins out of the body um also things like uh turmeric are, are really wonderful for for reducing inflammation mm -hmm. and also detoxing mm -hmm. uh rosemary uh helps with parasites so does cinnamon so there's there's a lot of things that we can do to put in our diet uh rather than doing these heavy uh, really intense i'm going to go on a fast for 10 days which right. is difficult which most, uh, most most people could not do. And so we're trying to find the medium uh, method that will be doable and practical for the, the greatest number of people. And I think you just, I know that you just touched on some very easy things that we can do. And, and it doesn't take that much to add to your diet. The other day I went into the store and I just bought a whole head of cilantro and all I did was wash it carefully and cut it up into my uh, salad. And I knew that that was just an, uh, it was just something I added. It tastes really good. And, um, you know, and it, and I know that it's doing good for the uh, heavy metals. So, yeah. yeah. And I think with the chlorella, isn't it important, Mark, to buy uh, the single cell chlorella that the kind that's been oh, the broken cell chlorella so that it is absorbable in the body if you're going to buy chlorella that sounds right but i'm not an authority on that so actually michelle that's maybe you can talk about the broken cell or single cell chlorella i i tend to like um the quality it's not really a chlorella it's a blue green algae from e3 live uh, from Klamath Falls, and I really find that when I um, when I take that, uh, I, I appear to have more energy, and if I go for a run, my lungs just seem to expand more, and I, I have more energy, and I don't seem to to uh, have more endurance. That's so, interesting. What, so, what, what was well, that called, Mark? It's uh, it's called it's a blue green algae from E3 Live. Oh. And I found that I found their product to just be the best on the market. But you know, everybody's going to have their own relationship with it. However, you know, all of the all of the uh, the you know, blue green algae, mm -hmm. whether whether it be chlorella, spirulina, or the the freshwater um, algae, they each person again is different. And I would just say experiment with it and see what provides you with the greatest effect mm -hmm. and the greatest health. And the other thing is, is if you're unhealthy, um, at first you might find that some of these things actually make you feel not so good because yeah. you're going to be detoxing and heavy metals are going to be coming up and mm -hmm. maybe you're going to be taking, you know, four or five bowel movements a day, maybe even have a little diarrhea, mm -hmm. but as things, but it's just your body cleansing. And as you stabilize, um, it just becomes much healthier. There's actually a name for that. It's called the Herxheimer's. And when you have yeah. a Herxheimer's reaction, it means basically you're, you're going to have the feeling of being ill before you feel better. So it's yeah. like, you know, seeing the light at the end of the tunnel, but you have to go through the darkness to get to the light. So let's move on to contentment, then the sea of medicine. Let's talk a little bit about, I know we touched on meditation and, and breathing, but 
how do you define the C, the contentment? Yeah, so you have mindfulness, exercise, diet and nutrition, internal cleansing. The contentment uh, is actually contentment, calm, rest, sleep, and rejuvenation. Mm. Uh, there's many people with sleep disorders, largely. Uh, you know, it's either, it's mostly going to be mental, emotional stress related that keep people up at night. Sometimes it's physiological, but all, again, all of these things can be taken care of through, you know, mindfulness, meditation, diet, exercise. Again, people who do these things actually find that they'll sleep better. Um, the big problem in our society is one of contentment. We haven't learned to just be content, mm -hmm. that to appreciate what we have right now for no other reason than just to be appreciative mm -hmm. and in gratitude for what we have mm -hmm. right now. Mm -hmm. um, I, I'll, I'll tell a little story that I think reflects this. Um, I was in Santa Monica and I was taking a run down the beach and was exercising near the pier. And on my way back, um, this homeless woman was walking down the street and she's shaking and looked like she had Tourette's. And it, it was interesting because I saw her as somebody who actually incarnated into that body and that role as a bodhisattva, a healer to allow the rest of us to feel gratitude for what we have right now. And as I approached her, I looked her right in the eyes and she stopped and she looked at me. Mm. I said, I want to thank you mm. for everything you're doing for humankind. Mm. Because of you, I feel so grateful. Mm. And she said, you really see me, don't you? I said, I think I do. Mm. She says, well, thank you for seeing me and appreciating me because it's pretty rare that people do. <sighs> Wow. You know, Mark, I had a very similar experience. This is so funny to, not funny, it's just, you know, syner synergistic that we both had this happen. But I was driving down um, La Tijera in, uh, in uh, Man uh, right by Manchester in uh, Westchester. And I was thinking all these thoughts about what I was going to be doing that day and my head was just, you know, my energy was high, but my, my mental state was completely, um, you know, going, going at, at uh, 100 miles an hour. Anyway, I, I'm driving along and there on the side of the road is this man with one leg. Uh -huh. And I stopped, you know, I was coming to a light and he was there and of course, you know, he was begging. And I thought, you know, if this isn't a reminder of how fortunate we are that we are sitting here, that I am sitting here in this car and driving to work and he is there. And I, you know, of course gave him some money. Um, but it's a similar kind of thing. I think, you know, people, people want to feel appreciated and no matter what condition that they're in. And, and we, as people who are so blessed and that's where, you know, it's called, uh, count your blessings, not your troubles, right? <laughs> so the, the fact that we could be so grateful and yet express to them how grateful we are for them showing us, they're kind of a catalyst. Uh, but uh, so I, I completely relate to what, what you're saying. Does, does that create greater contentment or does that create the stepping stones for gratitude, which does create contentment? Yeah, I think gratitude is... Um foundational to contentment mm -hmm. gratitude is foundational to abundance mm -hmm. true abundance right and yet we've been taught that you know we have to have more money and more products in a bigger house and mm -hmm. more boats or jets or whatever right. the possessions are and uh, unfortunately we've built a society where there has to be products that have built an obsolescence. They go out of fashion or they stop working. So we always need new stuff. And we have pretty much have detached ourselves from the regenerative aspects of our planet, the, the life-giving aspects that each of us actually have access to. And so when we can be content and when we can just, as you said, count our blessings and just 
love and be grateful for what we have right now. Take a breath. Take a breath. Become, <laughs> become calm. Right. When you when when you have calmness, you can actually rest. Right. When you're restful, it's easy to sleep. I'm taking breaths all through this discussion, Mark. <laughs> you've you've opened my my awareness that's, to that's probably one of the greatest things we can do. And okay. when you have sleep, your body rejuvenates. Right. And so you know, really that whole cycle of renewal and rejuvenation starts with contentment. You know, Mark, because I know we're going to run out of time and there's something that I really want you to share with us. So I'm going to ask if I can just go through intimacy, uh, the N and the E, or, or if we can maybe do that on our next show. Intimacy would take a whole show, I think. So I think maybe what we'll do is leave our viewers with some mystery about how to finish this. And, and I'd like you to share with us the, the uh, most important, compelling moment in your upbringing, the one that you shared with me and that you have in the prologue of your book about the tide pools, the abalone pools, because I don't think there's anything that will create awareness greater than this little five-year-old boy that you were being brought to a tide pool by your parents and what, and what happened. So would you share that with us before we have to say goodbye today? Sure. I'd be happy to, Michelle. Thank you. Um, wow, I've had a lot of profound moments in my life. I, I, I believe this experience or set of experiences actually set in motion an awareness and a sensitivity and a caring for the beauty of the planet and to see the potential of humankind for love and kindness and beauty, and yet the practice of our corporations and governments which are non-living entities. They don't breathe air, they don't drink water, they don't eat food, they don't appreciate beauty. Their red blood cells are purely based on profit and yet they make the regulations by which we all live by. So we've got, we've created a world for the non-living. And it really struck me at five years old when my parents took me to Avalone Cove tide pools. And literally I've yet to see tide pools that rival these throughout my life. And I've been to the barrier reef and Fiji and Hawaii and all over the world. And literally there are abalone shells like this big everywhere, sideways walking crabs, five colors of starfish, sea anemones pumping in and out, mm. the spiky urchins, little seahorses bobbing around. And I had never really experienced anything like that except in a Dr. Seuss novel that was read to be by, by mom. And all of a sudden, it came to life mm. as, as actually reality and part of our world. And at the time that I was uh, growing up in the Los Angeles area, um, oil was uh, being drilled and, and refined and there was horrible pollution and smog in the air and the regulatory environment around dumping toxins into the ocean and land were really not in place. Mm. And so a lot of petrochemicals and waste fuels and oil were being dumped into Santa Monica Bay along with pesticides and, and you know, suit raw sewage. Literally by the time I was 12 years old, there was not a single living thing left in those beautiful tide pools. They had been completely destroyed. Mm. And it really hit me at that moment that uh, we are so mistreating this beautiful planet and Mother Earth. And, um, you know, we're not going to save the planet. The planet is far more powerful than us, but we can serve the planet. Mm. If we serve the planet, we serve ourselves. And the more that we can serve the, the, the thriving of the planet, the more we will thrive ourselves. Mm. That is so beautiful, Mark. That's why I wanted you to share it because uh, I, I don't. Sometimes in storytelling, which in this case is a is a true story, uh, yeah. we learn so much uh, by the the actual human experience that that you had and why you are the unstoppable warrior that you are. And oh, you. Um, you know, I didn't really give you a. a 
uh, an inter a proper intro in terms of the diversity of your experience. But I think what we'll do is we'll have you come back on when your book is ready to be published. <clears throat> and I know you wanted to offer our guests um, an opportunity to order that book. So can we make a date to have you come on? Uh, when, when do you think the book will be published? I'm going to say a month and a half, two months. That depends upon my publisher right now. Okay. Um, still uh, have to, uh, the book is for all intents and purposes complete. They just need to design the cover, do the in interior template. Mm -hmm. And that uh, once that's done and that depends on them and the speed they move out and then it will be, it will ready, be ready and available <laughs> for, uh, for the public. And I'd also uh, like to offer the, uh, viewers of, of your show, Michelle, uh, potentially a, uh, a free or discount copy. I'll have to check with my publisher on what I can do about okay. that, but I will, I would love to do that. And, and autographed <laughs> if you would. And that too. I've got an <laughs> electronic right. signature, well, but. <laughs> well, we won't, we, we won't take that step yet because we want it to be real. And, and, you know, this is an eight year labor of love, uh, that Mark has embraced. And, uh, when I started reading, the uh, PDF, uh, I, I, I really did start to cry because it is so beautifully written. Now, this is 513 pages, so I can't admit to that I finished it. However, I can say that I got through the first 40 or 50 pages enough to know that this is brilliantly written, and I believe it's going to be a very big success for you, Mark. So, uh, and I know it, 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 it dovetails to so many other activities in your life and your everyday experience and particularly the dream of creating an, a center of awe, uh, a physical center. And uh, that will one day I know is going to happen if it already isn't in the works. I don't want to uh, it, steal it, your it, thunder. It's always in the works. It's one of those things, Michelle, where it's my purpose in life and I'm serving mm -hmm. you know, a much bigger purpose and it will either get built or I'll die trying. Um, and it, it's just in order to, to speak to that a little bit, um, our supply chain, the, uh, the most effective thing we could do is go pull an apple off a tree and eat it, but it's really bad for the GDP mm. because it didn't really create any jobs. It didn't burn any fossil fuel. The packaging industry was take, was taken out of the equation, uh, because we didn't need fossil fuel. We didn't, didn't need the industrial war complex. We uh, didn't need trucks and, and fueling of those trucks, uh, warehouse and distribution centers and refrigeration and retail stores in my car to get to the retail store. Mm -hmm. And because that apple was really healthy, the healthcare system or sick care system, as the case may be, didn't get its bite out of the apple. And so by building these communities that actually are regenerative and reconnecting to each other and our planet, as well as being centers for innovation in ag tech, aqua tech, renewable and clean energy, waste to energy, biomimetic materials. I believe that we can actually lower the, re the uh, uh, reliance and addiction that we have to centralized supply chain and money and have a much cleaner world as well as create truly heart-based innovation that will transform our world into a much more beautiful and thriving planet. Wow, what a vision, Mark. Well, I want to say um, a fond good farewell to you today, and thank you for joining us and sharing your wisdom and your passion and your vision. This is what Ageless and Timeless stands for, and um, it's all about the people who make the difference. So uh, thank you, Mark, and we will invite you back. Just let us know when that book is, is ready to be available for the public, and uh, we'll finish the medicine acronym and a few other topics as well. That so, sounds good, Michelle. All right. Thank you so much for having me on the show. I so appreciate you because you are an amazing being and warrior, and you have <laughs> full love and respect. So thank well, you so much. Yeah. Well, I totally fr coming from you, Mark. That is quite the compliment, and um, you know, the it's not an accident we chose "You Are Amazing" for the theme song of our podcast. So, um, we believe I believe you are amazing, and and all of my guests uh, are amazing, and that's why we're doing this. So, thank you again, and have a beautiful day. You too, Michelle. Thank you. Bye bye. 
Wow. <laughs> I'm breathless, but I know I'm supposed to be taking deep breaths, so I have to get to the place where uh, that's more relaxing and uh, meditative. It's hard to do when you speak to someone like Mark, who is uh, just so vital and uh, has so much to share, and that's why we'll, we'll definitely need him to come back uh, because we, we really... We really didn't even get, well, we scratched the surface, but we, we need to go deeper. So, and uh, just that whole subject of intimacy and love uh, will take up a whole podcast. And he has so much to say on that subject. So I just want to say um, thank you again for joining us. And uh, this is Michelle Hughes for Ageless and Timeless. I hope you have enjoyed this segment and you'll come back for more. Thank you. Bye-bye.